They don't have our names in back. <laughs> okay, good. All right. <laughs> Yes. Yes. More accurate. <laughs> um, so, uh, my name is Madeline Oldham. I am the director of the ground floor at Berkeley Rep, which is our center for the creation and development of new work. And I am delighted to be here with these talented and lovely people talking about some new plays. Um, so, can we start by just having you all uh, tell us, just remind us which play was yours, and uh, tell us how long it has taken for you to get your play to where it is right now? Oh. My name, I'm Terrence. Uh, I wrote Anacostia Street Lions. Um, I started the play in 2015, and it was weird, and so it got kind of put away for a little bit, and so then this week, uh, I came here and wrote a new draft of it, so it's been kind of off and on for the past two or three years, so yeah. Hi, I'm Deepika Guha. Uh, forgive my voice, I've lost it this weekend. Um, I found your voice. I, <laughs> <laughs> it's yours? I set that up for you. Um, I wrote a uh, yoga play, which was a SCR Crossroads Commission. I received the commission in 2015, and um, I thought about it for a couple of months and uh, wrote the first draft last summer. Uh, actually, at Berkeley Rep, in our writers group, the informal writers group, um, and then have been working on it mostly here since. Um, Michael Mitnick. Uh, I started writing the, uh, the Seagull in uh, 2014. That was very direct. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> okay, in the top floor of uh, Playwrights Horizons. <laughs> <laughs> and then in my apartment, sadly alone. <laughs> Excellent amendment. Um, okay, so. When you hear the question, why this play right now, how does that make you feel? <laughs> um, I, my, my response to that is just, why not? I don't know. I, why, why do we go see things? Because they, they make us happy, or they make us sad, or they make us feel something. Uh, I don't know. I want to. I want to go see. I want to read a book. I want to see a play. I want to see a movie, and they're all equal. I just want to. I just want to be changed by what I experience. I guess. I mean. I. It seems like uh, my play is becoming sadly more relevant as we go forward. Uh, so, I think it's there's some really um, some topics in it that I found this week that are very urgent to me. Um, and so it feels like the right time for it. It feels like a people, it seems like a time when people can kind of interpret it in a different way, in a way that I think resonates to a larger sort of picture. And it's, yeah. I think I needed to laugh, which, which is why I wrote the play. I kind of uh, really needed it and um, <laughs> I think um, the play is about cultural appropriation and identity politics, amongst other things. And I recognize that in this moment, we're um, deeply seeking a, a need to um, stand by our differences and be acknowledged for our differences. And at the same time, if we don't look for what's common in this moment, we're not going to get through it, I think. And so um, looking at yoga and a spiritual tradition, which counters the politics of um, uh, identity politics in a way uh, and um, argues for um, uh, seeking a kind of common consciousness or what unites us, I think, is perhaps what is speaking to this moment, or at least it's what I'm thinking about. Um, as you can see, we have some excellent uh, diverging opinions on this panel, which is awesome. Um, and do you, do you feel like a playwright has a responsibility to be able to articulate an answer to that question? Or do you feel like that's someone else's job to actually say, you know, talk about sort of a play in relationship to the current moment that we're in? I think other people do a better job of it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, for better or worse, we have a platform. 
and we've chosen this platform to be uh, <laughs> to be in dialogue and in conversation with others. So I think that uh, plays in their nature a lot of times do claim a thesis, whether or not it's um, overt. And hopefully there's enough space in that thesis for people watching to engage with it in, in whatever capacity. And, and that's the nature of the form, I think, um, whether or not you consider yourself a political playwright. But I think that this situation, this political situation, does feel urgent to me. And um, I do think, um, I am thinking about uh, what I might do to respond myself. So I, I, I think it's very natural in this moment um, I am seeking a strong response from, from theater. Yeah, and what makes, one of the things that makes theater unique and is special when you write something that is, uh, uh, has a political angle is that you can put it up very quickly. So if you can, have a, you can have a direct response to something that's going on in the world and then have a first class theater like this who actually puts it up. Whereas if you were to write a movie about something, it'll take seven years. And um, it doesn't mean that what you're talking about is is irrelevant, but that's something uniquely suited to theater. But specifically, what you asked about M M Madeline, I don't think you know. It's it's just uh, for me at least. You just you write it, and then everyone has an opinion. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael, I want to ask you about that because uh, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that putting a play up is a quick process. <laughs> No, it's not. And, you know, I've revealed that I've been doing this for this play for three years. But um, in general, you know, a, a lot of playwrights do have have um, microphones put up to the actors and write very quickly in response to you know what's going on in the world. And you can look at theaters across the country. Is that is people are writing in response to what's happening, and that's something that I think is very special about theater. That yes, it usually does take a long time, but if the pieces are in place, you, uh, your voice gets to a public much faster, which I think is, is probably as fast as journalism. There's an, I don't, yeah, you can't, you can't write a book that quickly. 400 pages, yes you can. <laughs> um, do, can either of you speak to kind of the, because actually, I mean, it, that is an interesting opinion that I, I, I personally don't uh, necessarily share, just on the other side of the play development. People have processes that take, because some people are very fast, it's true. And, and for, I think, but I think sort of the mechanism of theater and how long it takes to get from the first draft of something to an actual production of something. I mean, the fastest timeline that could possibly be is maybe nine to 10 months. Um, and even that seems not uh, as nimble as you might want to be in response to current events. And I think, you know, we in the field have a lot of conversation about, you know, is the work that we're doing being outstripped by the events in the news. Um, and so, you know, can, can other people sort of give us their take on, on what that is? Yeah, well, I think some plays become more relevant, you know, in certain, in like the political climate, like when you're writing about things that are in the zeitgeist, I kind of hate that word, but, you know, you're right, you're, you're kind of tapping into what's going on. And so, like, the cool thing about a play is that it could mean one thing two years ago and then something happens and then the play means something totally different. And so they're kind of nimble and chameleon-like in that way. They can, they, people are gonna bring their own things to the play and what they're thinking about. And so the play is seen in that light. And so I think when you program a play, you can look for certain things that kind of accentuate what's happening. and. It responds in that way, I think. That makes sense. I don't think we are responding fast enough. Yeah. I think it, it is often um, very slow. Um, just, uh, you know, writing a play itself can take a very long time, and then uh, being in conversation with the theater can take a very long time. And oftentimes that moment is gone. Um, and uh, that does seem to be the reality that we're living in right now, and um, it's it's very it can be very frustrating. Uh, but I think the form um, encourages a kind of theme, theme thematic explorations that perhaps films are a little less forgiving of. And um, 
to think about theme and ideas and character and that depth of exploration. I mean, hopefully there's something, if there is a positive to this, that it takes a long time to, to get there with a play and those are the things that um, perhaps speak over a longer period of time. Um, so yes, that's, that's, the, that's the silver lining if there is one, I think. Um, Michael, I just want to say you've exploded my brain just like a little bit <laughs> because I've always thought of us as really slow and the fact that you don't is amazing. And <laughs> seriously. No, but, but, it's, but uh, what I'm talking about is, is, is it, it theoretically. Is that if, if you at, at Berkeley Rep said we're going to put a play in, we're going to hold a slot for whatever playwright to do it, you could do it immediately. You could have a play, the, the question is then what, is the play ready or not? But um, it is, I, I'm, I'm speaking theoretically, that it is the fastest way to have uh -huh. a, an artistic <laughs> response to what's going on in the world if that's what you seek out to write. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then it's, does the theoretical actually become practical, which is a whole different can of worms. Um, so as you're uh, moving through the world in this time, um, the election is a thing that looms large for many of us and uh, I think feels like a different time than it did before the election. And all three of you sort of started thinking about your plays pre-election. Um, has your thinking about them changed at all since? And if so, I mean, I, you touched on this a little bit, but if we could expand a little, that would be great. Yeah, I think uh, this week I really figured out what the play was about. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and there's this, just this idea that like, you know, because post-election, I was kind of dealing with like, what am I really doing? You know, like I'm playing make-believe in a theater. Like, is that enough? You know, um, is and so like I'm starting to think about like how I can use theater as to be an advocate, you know, and, and as my form of advocacy. And so thinking about this play, it really dawned on me this week that it's about like challenging what we're told, you know. And so and, and that seems really important right now, like not just going along with the narratives that are being pushed forward, but like really doing your homework and questioning the things that you might not have questioned before. And so yeah, the play kind of opened up in that way, and I don't know if I would, if I wasn't in this headspace, I would have found that, that thread in it. And so, so yeah, it totally does. Um, yeah, my, I'm, I'm responding to the climate in that way in the play, in, in a way that I wasn't before at all. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> well, yeah, it, uh, I started writing it obviously before the election, and then the election is a major part of my play um, with the character of Alice. And um, when I saw what was going on in the world and made me very upset, it just gave me more to put into her character. And um, luckily, I knew someone who had her job in real life. And so it became a conversation. And I think all of us, it's, and everyone in this room, is that what we do is we're trying to figure out not just, we're not trying to tell people things, we're also trying to figure out things about ourselves and what we think about the world. And in writing, yeah, in writing The Seagull after the election, I think the only things that really changed were the jokes. But they stopped being funny. Because <laughs> it was scary. So in a way, actually what I did was cut, yeah, that's true, I cut more, more of what was relevant out of the play because it killed the humor. And are you able to say how that, like, how does that work? I mean, what, was it just things that didn't feel um, resonant anymore? Or, I mean... I mean... Like, how did you know what, what was funny and what wasn't anymore? Well, that's easy. That's, I mean, that's, that's the best part, is, is if you're writing something that's intentionally meant to be a comedy, I get to stand in the back of the room and listen to, to all of you and, and hear if you laugh or not. Mm -hmm. So if, it did, if you didn't laugh, I cut it. <laughs> and then the next day I tried to think of something funnier or I asked the actors, do you have anything funnier? <laughs> and then we had a conversation and we talked about their characters and would this character say that? And then I tried to make the play better. And so I wanted things that were intentionally meant to be funny, to, to get laughs, and moments that I wanted to, to uh, 
be a, a, a I, for lack of a better word, not funny, um, <coughs> uh, I guess more truthful, um, pair it away because I, you know, a Donald Trump joke in the, in the middle of an important scene takes it in another direction. Um, well, I, <clears throat> I, I come from a lot of places. I grew up in India, and then we lived in Russia, and then England, and I moved to the United States 10 years ago. And I came here on a scholarship um, called the Frank Knox Scholarship to Harvard University, and um, American philanthropy basically underwrote my education in playwriting. So I have always felt deeply uh, welcome here, and... Um, I would not have my life without it and without that encouragement of um, uh, my teachers and um, certainly people who put their faith in me before I had written a play. Um, and so it was very, I took it kind of, uh, for better or worse, I took it very personally after the election. <laughs> I sort of started feeling, questioning of whether I belonged here or not and what I could possibly say you know, uh, as a playwright who comes from a lot of places, writing in this country. Um, and um, I think the yoga play is in a lot of ways about multiple allegiances and how uh, you can come from somewhere but feel at home somewhere else and um, how important that is for our uh, common understanding of each other. And I think that sort of comes through in the play, that I think your politics sort of out, the play is out you whether you uh, uh, plan them, plan for them to or not, and I, I think we're outing each other constantly, and um, in in some way, and I think it it probably does that. But it's a it's a plea for uh, understanding that kind of intersectionality in in our souls as well as our lives, and um, sort of recognizing that in each other that um, uh, that we belong in a multiple multiplicity of places and when we do there's an opportunity there um, to recognize yourself in someone else and, and that's what theater does I think fundamentally we're building structures for empathy and places for belonging and I think of theater making as place making and um, uh, that's ultimately what I seek refuge in I think for myself that it's an opportunity for me to, to do that and, and hopefully for other people to feel like they have a place when they see the play, that would be the best outcome for me. So, yeah. Um, do you feel like uh, there is a different set of expectations for you as a playwright at all? Like, do you, do you feel a sense of sort of what the field is asking from you now to be different than what it was before the election? Yeah, I think that we we wanted we want to see something that is relevant. It's like the the theme of of the panel. Why this play now? So there's 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 an imperative when something happens as a playwright. Um, it's a, just a smart thing to do is to write about what's going on in the world because it makes your play more relevant than they'll want to do it. <laughs> but no, I, I I don't know. I I, I think I put the pressure on myself uh, to respond. Um, and I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I, like when I start a play, I kind of, and, and thinking about my audience, I kind of think about the play that I need or the play that I want to see and the characters I want to see on stage. And so I put that as like the guiding principle in my plays. And so I want to see black people in the future. So I write a play about black people in the future, you know? And so... <laughs> And so it becomes this sort of like self-satisfying thing and, and it, it becomes my like how I cope with things. Like I, I get what you're saying, like that, I think there is a great place for making space and like seeing yourself. And I think that's important right now to see yourself reflected on stage and, and whatever all the colors and layers they're in, you know, like there's, and so I put that on myself and that seems to be something that people are responding to. Um, because I think we are all really open and seeking understanding. And so, yeah, so, so I, put it, I put that on my side. I don't feel like there's a, some overarching 
write this play, you know, I need this kind of, but I, I'm doing that for myself because there are plays that I need. There are things that I need to see. So it's very, it's very selfish in that way. And then for some reason, other people want to see it too. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> um, I, yes, I am asking as uh, every uh, few days if, if theater is enough. And I think, and, and um, what the, what, you know, how best I can contribute, how best I can respond, and is this enough? And I'm trying to think more broadly about that question um, as well. But I'm, I'm fundamentally interested in how a question of how we live, just how, <laughs> every day, you know, what, what are we supposed to do? Mm -hmm. And how do you know what to do with yourself? with ourselves, and I think that that, I mean, every morning, Madeline, and not pleasant to live with, um, <laughs> sort of waking up with that question, but I think if you have the, the privilege and the, uh, the luxury, in a way, of, of having the time to ask that question, um, that's, that's what happens, from, that's underlying all, everything, and, um, you know, I think through the attraction with yoga and the, the kind of this here is uh, the spiritual traditions also ask that question. But I think um, when you have the space to ask that question, it becomes the most important question. Yeah. Um, has any of you tried to write a play based on like a newspaper story? Like something that you read that day and was like, oh my God, I have to write about this? No. <laughs> in grad school, Michael Corey, once, um, who taught both, both Michael and I, once made me write a song about polar bears, <laughs> ice caps melting. Um, it's called I'm, I'm on Thin Ice. <laughs> it's the only time. It was very good, too. Uh, no, wait, Dipika, it, you're, you have an interesting expression on your face. How did you feel about the song? Did you, did you like it? My, Michael seemed to enjoy it. <laughs> I liked it. I liked it okay. <laughs> I think as, an, as a grad school exercise I did, but it, it never uh, reminded of it and I might go back to it now. <laughs> really? I mean, because part of the reason that I ask that question is sometimes people ask us, or at least people in my position and me personally a lot, kind of sometimes people will say, I read this newspaper story, this would make a great play. And I think that's really sort of challenging. And I think it's interesting that that has not been an a point of inspiration for any of you, really. And can, can you talk about if there's a reason why? Well, I don't, I don't know if I've done it that directly. I think, like, the interesting thing about my plays is that, like, little time capsules of, like, what I was reading and thinking about then. And so there's, like, there is that article I read on, in the Washington Post, and then there's the episode of Family Guy I was watching. And, like, it's all this, like, really weird stuff that kind of goes into this, like, blender. And when I, like, when I sit back and look at it, I was like, oh, that's, that's, I know where that came from. Or that's that, that's from that book I was reading. Or... That was, and so they, so it, it's never that like translating the article into a play, but it all kind of goes into the mix. Well, I mean, I constantly read things that make me want to write plays, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it, there isn't, there isn't, I don't have an impulse to go, I want to make a point. It just doesn't occur to me. It, it's, it's like I, in grad school, the very first day I read an article about Thomas Edison. And, uh, and so I've been writing about Thomas Edison for 10 years. And then through the writing of that, it's, it's linked into now with you know, fake news and smear campaigns and a lot of things that people would say are timely or it, it, when this thing comes out as a movie, may think is a response to what's going on, but uh, there's nothing new under the sun. It's that, it's that we make mistakes and we make them again and we, we try to fix it. I think I write towards what I don't know and what I can't see but feel. And I think that to me is the secret, is in the secret of the play, is the secret DNA. So then you can, you can support that with scaffolding, at least I can, and I do a lot of research. But I think that's the, the current that I'm after is what is, um, 
unspeakable and unknown and sometimes it's dangerous and sometimes it's funny and sometimes I wish I didn't know. <laughs> um, but that's, that's, I think, the thing that I'm looking for. Um, and part of the reason that I asked that question is a, a question that writers get asked a lot is where do your ideas come from? And that's a, it's just such a hard question to answer. Um, and I think, Terrence, you just articulated a really lovely way to think about it, which is, I think, generally true for most, if not all, writers that um, it's never one thing, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you're sort of moving through the world with this different set of antennae and, and kind of bringing things in that then influence each other. Is that, am I? Yeah, I know? think there, there's, there are so many times in life where I'm, I, I, I witnessed something and I was like, nobody else in the world could do anything with that but me. Like that, I feel like the, the world set me up to see this because I needed to see it. <laughs> like, because they're just like the strangest little occurrences and, and, and like, and, and also I, people tend to like tell me things, and like they confess to me and they're like, I've never told anyone that before. And I was like, why did you tell me? But, and so like, I, and so like, and then I steal those things. I put those things into my work and so like, the, um, so it just comes like it becomes like really human and so really you're the last person they should be confessing <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. hey but that's the question I ask myself this little question all the time it's like am I a writer because people tell me stories or do I tell stories because I'm a writer and that's like my little puzzle thought <laughs> I'm never talking to you again <laughs> I've already got let's go to stuff. lunch <laughs> Does, uh, so it, we've talked a lot about sort of political response and political work. Um, how does entertainment factor into this for you all? I think there, there are different kinds of plays. And what's, what, there are so few opportunities for playwrights and so few physical buildings to put up plays that there's an imperative and, and it's important that plays are speaking be to uh, about what's going on in the world because that's been the role of theater since people started telling stories, uh, which immediately happened when they were able to tell each other things. But um, it's odd for me to think about theater as a place that only can do certain things because if you go to a bookstore, remember those, it, is, that, is that there are all these different sections of things that we go to to read to have fun, horror things, mysteries, uh, fiction, nonfiction, and I, I want all of that to exist in the theater, but people will think, think of it in different ways, or they think musicals are even something else, where really it's, I don't understand it. It's, it's all, in my brain, it's all one thing. It's that we all get together and we see something, and then we have our response to it on, on the walk to the uh, car. It's curious, isn't it? Because I feel sometimes that there is a tension here, that the, the, the desire to be entertained is, is to, to not think. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just want to switch off and you turn to the entertainment to, to do that. That, that there, is, there is a thing that there are different plays and plays have different functions. And I think um, entertainment absolutely has a, a function in so mm -hmm. soothing our souls, especially now. Um, but I think... Uh, <coughs> Plays in the form of the form of the thing invites thought, and uh, it invites us to think and perhaps think about things that we're uncomfortable with, and um, think about things in different ways. And I think that that's a tension that you're writing a little bit as a playwright, like how to how to invite thought and um, uh, invite everybody in at the same time. Yeah, that's one of the like um. I'm, when I write, I'm constantly thinking about the fact that it's going up in front of a live audience. Mm. And so I try to write plays that really push the medium, that really utilize the fact that we're all in this room in one space together. And so like, I'm gonna fuck with you when you're in one of my plays. It's gonna be, gonna be weird, it's gonna be awkward, it's gonna be fun, hopefully, it's a little laughing, but I'm gonna hit you with like, you're laughing, and then it's like, oh no, but that's not funny. <laughs> because cause I, cause I, th I think that's what life is. Life is really funny until it's not, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like plays should sort of reflect that. And so you're, you're gonna laugh, but then while well, I got you laughing, you're open to catch another meaning. You know, like while you're uncomfortable in your seat, you, you get something else. And so I'm really trying to 
entertain and push the push just like use theater for what it's good for you know as opposed to like writing a play that can be a movie you know I try to think about the space and using those sort of the the tools in the kit you know what do you wish the field of theater was doing right now that is not I think uh, inclusivity is my big thing right now. Um, it was just, it's like occurring to me, you know, as a, as like a playwright, my ultimate goal is to have a show on Broadway, you know, like, well not, I, this is what I'm thinking about lately, but that's like seen as the pinnacle of your career, I guess. And so, but, but and so, and I, and I, I find conflict in that, in that I'm writing, stories about my family and people I know and they wouldn't be able to afford the ticket to go and see it, you know? And so like, there's that, that disruption and, so, and, and that, and so like, how does that color my work? And so like, I'm, as I'm moving forward in my career, I'm trying to think about how I can create and um, sort of demand the audiences that I want to see it because, you know, like I write for for people to see themselves on stage and see themselves in ways that they haven't and for actors to be able to express themselves on ways that they, they're not always able to. And the audience and who's seeing is a big part of that. And so, in, like, for figuring out ways to get the people on the margins and not, and taking away this, like, sort of idea that it's this elite thing that we do and we get dressed up for it and and how that distances people from it. And so just kind of thinking about, again, creating the spaces to have the sort of experiences with the play that I'm like really seeking. Like I, I used to be religious as a kid and I'm not anymore. And I realized that like through theater, I'm still seeking that like church feeling. Like I'm, I still want that like community. And so how, how I can build a community within the theater that I'm like, it's all very selfish. I just, I, me, me, yeah. But, but yeah, it's just kind of like using it to speak to a broader sort of audience, basically. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the, if I could change one thing, it's the, it's the cost of getting in the door. It's, uh, I, I don't know how theater can remain relevant if, if the prices keep soaring like this. It's unreal how much it costs to go see a show in New York. It's ridiculous. And if you want, if you want to be relevant or be telling something, then it has to compete with where else people are going to go spend their time. So in my, I, I think that if a, a theater ticket has to cost the same amount as a iTunes download, and I don't, I know, I don't know how that works. But um, that's if I could. You asked me if I could change one thing. That's it. I think both those things, inclusivity and cost, they go hand in hand, I think in many ways. And I think uh, for me, it's an imperative to have a lot, to see theater that is having a larger conversation with the rest of the world. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm yearning constantly to see the ways in which we're interconnected right now. And um, I, I would love to see more theater that focused on that because we've, we have the internet and it's uh, severing our connections with each other <laughs> instead of doing the opposite. And we're more isolated now than we've ever been before. And we have this um, tremendous opportunity here to be together in this room and um, despite being from different backgrounds and different places. And, and, what's, and what she's saying is, is, is amazing because this is also the only place where they'll really, really punish you if you keep your cell phone on. <laughs> But it, I'm saying it as a, jo as a joke, but it's real, is that, is that you have to turn it off and then you have to focus and all sit in the same direction and watch something. So even if, you know, people will get angry at you if it buzzes in your pocket because they paid a lot of money for the ticket and they want to enjoy the experience. <laughs> but if you go to the movie theater and it buzzes, you can't really complain to someone. And so the fact is you're focused and on watching it uh, in, in a much more powerful way simply because you're forced to be in a dialogue with the dialogue on stage. Yeah, I really enjoy having conversations with people still. <laughs> Crazy as that is. Um, but it's hard without your cell phone going off. 
or that that pull of attention and um, while we have it I, I I would just you know like um, yoga play deals with the privilege and quite a, we talked a little bit about this yesterday and um, you know I, I like to think about how we're all privileged in some form and and whenever you benefit off someone else's suffering that's privilege and um, this is something that is global it's universal and um, I think the more we see that, hopefully, you know, and that's a kind of negative example, but the, the more we recognize that, hopefully, the, the closer it brings us together. And I think that's the experience that I want, a sense of coming closer together. And um, often I feel excluded. I think either for the ticket cost or the, you know, that's an experience I have. We're not seeing um, a diversity of experience and age and, you know, class and race and ethnicity on stage, all of that. And do you feel like we live in a culture in this country, on the whole, that values art? No. <laughs> Some people do, but I mean, it, I, it would be a generalization. Uh, I think that, that, no, I mean, look at what's going on with the NEA, it's right there. That's your answer. Maybe art, but not artists sometimes. I sometimes feel like I'm a problem, um, and I am a problem, but like in, a, in another kind of way, you know, um, sort of it's hard to get health insurance, and um, you don't have a structured sort of every day, so people don't know how to, what to do with you, or how to have lunch with you, so there's that, there's the small things, but there's also the, the larger questions of... Um, how you fit within a social structure that I think sometimes is difficult in, in the US. So I feel like um, our artists a little bit and supporting our lives in a, a way, is, is, it's very difficult. I don't know, you kind of sent me into a rabbit hole with that question. I don't know what I think right now. I, I feel like there are people that w want us to believe that it isn't. But I don't know if that is thinking thoughts right now. <laughs> I mean, I think it's easier when there's something tangible in front of you and something for people to engage with and they're like, oh, that's art. But when it's in process, like, what do you do with that? And, you know, the theater theater's full of people who are so great at being in process and looking at early drafts and, like, talking um, about ideas with you before they are real and it's it's terrifying to to share that when something solid doesn't exist yet and i think to think about art as process is something that's like is something that we all need an education about and perhaps more of an education would help us i mean yeah it's what, it's, it's what you're talking about is is why this now is you could it's is why do we need a painting why do we need a play is that someone could say it's more uh, take that money and give it to someone so they can eat but we we live for art, it's art is love, and that's why we live. And so, if you live in a culture without love, then why are you alive? End of play. <laughs> I know. Seriously, what else is there to say after that? So I do, I do want to ask a question about um, sort of the the what I think of as the impermanence of theater and sort of what that means to each of you, um, because when you have a film or a book or a painting or a thing that sort of can endure, that's a very different thing than uh, like you do have a script, but that's not the whole picture. Like the whole picture is a production that's up and running that has all the, the components together that you can see, like that is the play. And why is that appealing to you? <laughs> because it's so much fun. Yeah. It's so much fun to, to get together with other people that <clears throat> it's weird to use a word like vision but you're all trying to make something, and, you're, and hopefully you're all trying to make the same thing. And the fact that I wrote it 
and I'm the writer is, is no less relevant than the fact that there's a person whose full-time job is to design the set that's behind me. And that we all get together and try to make something that's the same, and when you succeed, it's, it's, it's one of the most powerful things and it hits you because it isn't going through a screen of light or an iPad, it's, it's right here. So if you can nail the truth with seven people, or way more than that, 30 people coming together to try to do the exact same thing, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's powerful on a nuclear level. And that is, that's why theater is the most fun for me. Yeah, I, I would kind of agree with that. The, uh, because like I, cause I feel like the, I don't, I try not to think that like my play is going to change people. I feel like that's a really lofty goal. You know, like you're going to come to my play and walk out a new person. Like, mm, probably not. But the but I I know that that I know that that capacity is for change is possible in the rehearsal process and like working with people on the script and like you know things come up and you get and and you like you make friends with these people for this 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 brief amount of time but they become your friends and you know them forever you know and so like you have these little rooms where you 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 tell like your deepest secrets and and people respond and there is like actual change and people discover things about themselves and and so that's sort of like this beautiful process and so I and also am like, like just thinking about like collaboration I try to like write challenges for people in my plays you know like I I love like it's it's really surreal that people want to sit around and work on something I just made up you know like like why are you doing this this is just I just made this up and so <laughs> and so like so I, I want to like I want to uh, I want to put little, and so like, and so I like having people use their art to interpret my art, and so I kind of write little challenges for designers and costumers, like they're gonna be hanging upside down in this scene. Go, like I don't, I don't have to figure out how you're gonna do that. <laughs> That's not my job. And so, and, and so you create these like these little spaces and these like, it's all about the community for me. It's like it's just the you create these rooms where change is actually possible. And whether that translates to the audience, um, if it does, great. But it's all about the, like, the work that's being done. So yeah. Yeah, I think I'm a masochist. That's true. I think you have to be to do this in a way. But the other, the other side of that is um, I studied with Paula Vogel, who talks about how she loves plays for their flaws. And I think that that is this form. It's full of flaws. You see all the, you see everything. Like Michael was saying, there's nowhere to hide. Play outs you. Um, it, it's difficult to get along sometimes, and there are challenges. And like that effort, I think, is the effort of change. And you know that everybody to make something with someone else, you have to change, and maybe and change deeply. And um, sometimes you don't realize how until long after the process. But I think that I love theater because of the flaws and the, the transitions that everybody sees and the dropped lines and the fact that it's real and it's happening. Yeah. And, and just that they're, like, you get second chances, you know? If it's terrible one night, it's over, it's done. <laughs> it's gone. And no one will ever see that again. <laughs> Yeah, so you just, there, there's opportunity for multiple chances, and you get, and, and with subsequent productions, you get to see new people feel it, and and then that's done. So yeah, I think it's sort of like kind of beautiful in that way. Also, the magic of actors and the actor's voice on stage and the lights and everything, you know, in here and. The, the, the risk that we take every time we trust the unfolding thing in front of us is a sort of life lesson and one that I learn every time that I'm in here and I see something and I don't know what's going to happen. Um, do any of you have a dream project that you think is too impossible that nobody will ever do? I have a dream project. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. I, yeah. <laughs> I used to, I used to, and there's a, you know, Tipica and I, we spent a long time, three years talking every single day about, you know, what a play should be or shouldn't be or can be or can't be, and, um, 
you know, there's certain realities that you, you have to deal with if you're a playwright. Like, if you're going to write 10 locations, the play is much more expensive unless it can be done in a non-realistic way. So I used to think, okay, what I should do is write fewer people, make the play cheaper, make the play as relevant as possible, and then it'll go to as many places as possible. But that's not fun. And also, like, if you have like, something in your brain that says you can't do that, then you're already, mm-hmm. you're already behind. Because I think when we write the best is when we're invisible. And so if something, is, if, if something comes out or we write something that is so ex- seemingly so expensive, then the challenge is we're potentially hurting the, the, the future of the play, but we're also sending out a message saying, let's see if we can figure this out live. Why, well, let's, let's, let's do someone upside down on stage. Let's fly someone, let's, let's have 31 locations, let's have 90 actors, and then let's all go broke, but let's do it. I think every play feels impossible to me. <laughs> Every play, um, I and mean, we were taught that every play should have something impossible in it, at least if the whole conceit is not impossible. But yeah, I think there is the magnetism of writing a new play is, is something that's a little bit beyond reach, that's something that's a little bit impossible that goes beyond one's own conception of it almost. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's the only reason to, to do it for me. Um, and then how that translates, I, 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 don't, I don't often think about is, is true. Like, I don't know how, that, how people are going to receive that because I don't know how I'm going to receive it myself. Would you like to share what your dream project is or would you like to keep that to yourself at this moment? I want to share it because someone might help me do it. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, there's, a, um, there's this Afro-Cuban artist named Wilfredo Lam. I have this... One of the things tattooed on my arm. <laughs> You're not gonna. <laughs> I, I guarantee our plays will be super different. <laughs> uh, let's do that. Let's all three of us write the same play. But, About the same thing. But, but I, I, I want to. So he's, so he's Cuban, and I want to go to Cuba and, like, really because I want to really understand it before I write it. And, and that's why I haven't written. I've been thinking about this play for like five or six years, but I, I know that I'm operating from a place of not understanding. And so I need to submerge myself in his life in a way that I can't in America, like I, that I can't in a book, you know? And so, so yeah. And what is it about this particular artist that makes you want to write a play? He's magic. Mm. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and that's what we're after, I think, is magic. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's true. It's, 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 magic tricks are very close to theater, except that magic is, I think, the only thing that's even pure, because if it's a good trick, a theater asks us to suspend our disbelief, magic doesn't ask. It's like music, is that, you know, you could go see, uh, I won't name something, but something that you may not dig, and then the hairs on your arm stand up, is that, it's magical. So if you can capture that in a play, it, it, it's very powerful. Michael is a great magician. Also. <laughs> Michael is also a great uh, leaving us with nuggets person. <laughs> uh, so I think that's where we have to stop. I want to say thank you so much to South Coast for putting together this amazing festival. Thank you, writers.